Okay, thank you. So unfortunately, there's no food value for this, if there is any value at all. So this is somewhat different from all the talks before. So, um, stochastic control. So it's three part. I may. Uh, I think this 50, 45 minutes is it, right? So I'm, I'll probably go to the uh, end of second part. If there's time left, I'll go for the third. The first one is the um, basic research reward for Markov chain is based on this paper, which has already appeared with uh, Venkatanantram. So I'll give some background first. So this is a well-known formula for the principal eigenvalue of positive definite symmetric matrix called current fisher formula. And um, uh, suppose one considers, instead of a positive definite matrix, just a non-negative matrix. Okay, so irreducible non-negative matrix Q, which probably is in particular run into often. Uh, then you know a few things, I mean, the most famous result is the peron frobenius theorem, which tells you that it has a positive principal eigenvalue and an associated positive eigenvector. So the question is whether there's a counterpart of this formula for non-negative matrices, not positive definite. And the answer is yes. Called the collard Wieland formula, which deserves to be known better, for some reason not as well known as Courant Fisher. And there are these two, two statements. Incidentally, you should note that it's the same object here. You are not flipping, it's not min max equal to max min. So, okay, I mean, if you stare at it, you will see what I mean. There's one other characterization which are kind, came from probability side. So this is of course, lin, these are linear algebra people. So for that, I first pull out the uh, right Q as D times P, where D is, uh, D is the diagonal matrix, so they're, they're just row sums. So divide the call, uh, rows of each row of Q by the row sum and multiply and divide. So you can write it as a, once you divide it by the row sum, it becomes a probability vector. So it will become a stochastic matrix and I've pulled out the row sums and put them as the diagonal elements of this. So I can write non-negative matrix as a diagonal matrix times a stochastic matrix. So these are uh, the interpretation as transition probabilities. Let uh, the script G0 denote these pairs. So P tilde is a stochastic matrix and pi is some stationary probability and need not be unique. Stationary probability for the stochastic matrix P, uh, P tilde. Then this representation of the log of lambda is equal to this. This is the discrete version of Donsker version formula. I learned it from here. The, I mean, the most famous version is actually for diffusion process, self adjoint diffusions. That, but I know that they also have some, um, I'm less familiar with the discrete work. So I'm sure it's buried somewhere in their work. Oh, D is the usual D. What? Oh, that's the, I did define it. Oh, okay, I, I made it, sorry. Notational change. Here it was a subscript, uh, made it an argument. So this is the kullback leibler divergence or relative entropy. Okay, now I'm going to go for infinite dimensional versions of this so far. For the linear case, there's already a famous result. So the infinite dimensional generalization of Perron Frobenius theorem yeah, has been around. It's called Klein Rudman theorem. So you start with a Banach space and there's a positive cone, a cone which you call positive, with the property that you take uh, k minus k. That is, if you take uh, uh, vectors of the form x minus y, where x and y are in k are dense in B, and you look at a compact positive linear operator which is strongly positive. So Strongly positive means given a non-negative function, it maps it into a positive function. Okay, non, non, uh, I am not yet in a function space. So uh, given a non-negative element in K, it, uh, an element in K, it will pop, uh, map it into its in, an element in its interior. Then uh, the uh, counterpart of Perron frobenius holds. There's a principal eigenvalue, unique positive, and there's a corresponding positive eigenvector. Now, what we want to, uh, want to do is to go for a nonlinear version of it. And it's not any nonlinear, of course, that, it, that may not even be feasible, but something which specifically arises in control problems. So now I'll give some background. So I have a controlled Markov chain on a compact matrix space S. 
you look at a, uh, of course there has to be a, this is a state process which is controlled by some control process that uh, ZNVJ tech to be in a compact matrix control space U. And there's a reward function, per stage reward function. So each time, uh, give, based on the current state, next state, and the current control, you get uh, some function of it as your reward. There's a control transition kernel, which I, I'm currently assuming it's full, uh, it has a full support the, uh, in the, that is any open set in the uh, state space will have strictly positive probability. This I'll return to later. It can this can be relaxed. So there's some control transition kernel. If so, if your current state is x n and your current control is z n, you choose z n. Then probability of being in set A at the next time is given by some kernel like this. And this is a technical condition. I assume this is equicontinuous. This, for example, if you I mean I'm going very general here, but suppose this is some subset of RD and you have a sort of smooth, your transition probability has some smooth density, this kind of thing is free. So the actually the major restriction here is the fact that I'm using compact state space. I'll return to that later. That's a non-trivial. So I cannot apply this to RD. I'll have to take some close bounded subset of it. Okay, so the control problem is to maximize the asymptotic reward. So, uh, so this is called risk sensitive reward. So this expected value of sum of, so this is the uh, cost at, reward, sorry, reward at time n. So the current at time m, it is state is, uh, current state is xm, next state is xm plus one and current control sets so can depend on all three of them. You take expected value log one by n and the idea is that you want to maximize the limiting uh, kind of asymptotic growth rate. Now there's a sup supremum or initial condition, which in fact at present it's redundant, but once I drop the full support condition, it will be needed. So right now I'm keeping it there. And uh, we allow for, uh, okay, so maybe I'll return to the uh, this a little later, but let me just motivate this a little. So this there's this, this some historic reasons why people looked at this. So I mean, there are very old papers by, for example, this is not Infinite Horizon, but this Howard Matheson. So Howard is a man who had, who had done hell of a lot in, in Markov decision process, including the famous policy iteration algorithm and so on. And the, a little later, there is another, these are kind of classical works in this direction, but it had not picked up much, it remained kind of a curiosity. Some point in the 80s, there are continuous time versions by Benson and others. But uh, interest in this picked up for a variety of reasons. One was that there was particularly from finance community, there was a need for going beyond the usual expected value formulation. So typical cost uh, people will look at is something like this, or reward, say some discount parameter alpha in zero, uh, which is between zero and one, strictly less than one and some This would be discounted reward. So the thing is, these are expected values of something, but then expect, expect, just expectation can be misleading. There, the fluctuation can be very high. So particularly for finance people, that's a, I guess everybody should worry. But in particular, finance people were worried about it. So they had kind of ad hoc modifications, such as this time some plus some. So this is the this is the sample cost, this is the expectation, and then you take its variance. So expected value plus variance. So for example, this Markowitz formulation has this flavor. But this becomes painful in the sense that you cannot do dynamic programming with it. See, the dynamic programming is possible when there's something called principle of time consistency. The that term goes back to Isaacs, which who apparently predated, there's some historical issue there. He predated Bellman, but got forgotten somehow. So that is that is to say that suppose I look at the problem from uh, time zero onwards, and then look at time n onwards, that's another kind of co optimal control problem embedded in this. You don't have to start thinking re uh, afresh. I, I don't know how to explain this, but if you are familiar with dynamic programming, so you write the dynamic programming equation, you look at the minimum re or maximum reward now is maximum of the current reward plus expected reward from next time on, next stage on. Okay, so from next stage on, it's a similar looking problem. You can kind of uh, 
to partition i mean if you take two disjoint uh, uh, time from now till n and n onwards from n onwards uh, you have some kind of a clone of the problem you see at time zero that's not true here see this uh, this cost i could have split from n equal to zero to say 10 and 11 onwards 11 onwards it looks some, something similar to what i had i just have to pull out uh, alpha raised to 10 out but the flavor is the same that's not true once you have this so the person who really popularized this is uh, another big, big man in this field called Peter Whittle, who kind of argued that once you have this exponentiation, for one thing, if you write it, uh, if the if you have some small parameter here, theta times this whatever I had there, log. Okay, and if you just write a Taylor series in terms of theta, then the first two terms will approximate this, that is one reason. And in a sense, uh, once you read, uh, you read the entire uh, Taylor expansion, then you are capturing all movements in some sense. So it's, it's more, it can capture the, uh, it penalizes the fluctuations also. Because that's why it's called risk sensitive. Of course, uh, this uh, sign of this matters. So if it's positive, which is the usual case, uh, you call it, uh, is it risk? Averse, if it's negative, you're risk seeking, you, you're a gambler. If it's actually the long run average ends up being the limiting case as theta tends to zero, that is, you just try to minimize its limit of m equal to say zero to n minus one, minimize or maximize whatever. This ends up being a limiting case as theta tends to zero. So this is called risk neutral. This is an older problem. Again, the DP equation for was first, the dynamic programming equation was derived by Howard. So that's the motivation, and again, there are the, the, some people in finance community picked it up in a big way, particularly Bileski, Pliska, and uh, Nagai, and so on. At least mathematical finance community, I don't know if real financiers care, I mean, you would know. <laughs> okay, so that's the background. So I define this kind of uh, conditional, uh, so this would be one step conditional cost. Um, said here that this is, this is just a technical jargon. Uh, what this means is that you allow randomization of controls. So I, I, I think of, instead of thinking of U, uh, my control space had called U, instead of thinking of U valued control, I think of controls taking values in probability measures on U because I'm allowed to randomize. So that's what this is doing. So phi is my randomized control, phi to U, and this whole integral is one step conditional expectation that defines an operator, and of course, take, taking the, maximizing the one step condi conditional reward over all possible controls that give, defines this nonlinear operator. And I define this it's iterated with itself. So T0 by convention is identity and this is the end time iterate of itself. This is actually another object in control called Nisio semi group. It maps continuous functions to continuous functions under conditions I have given and these are the standard properties strictly increasing, strongly positive. Okay, so it maps a uh, non-negative function which should not be zero, I forgot to add that into the strictly positive. It's positively one homogeneous, this is also important, so if I put some positive scalar here, I can pull it out. It's a compact operator under technical conditions I have given that equicontinuity, etc. And then well, the first thing we proved was this abstract collard land formula, which is what do you expect. Okay, so this is the first part was not that hard. And the log row ends up being the optimal reward for the risk sensitive control problem. And this was facilitated by the fact that people have worked on nonlinear versions of Klein Rutman theorem. The list I gave of uh, these conditions is precisely what you need to apply that. That's why I stated this. And uh, this, uh, it, there, there are two different uh, papers, but particularly this guy has an, a massive paper in Japanese journal, which basically uh, ready made recipe for doing such things. So the next thing to try was uh, getting an analog of Donsker version formula. So I have to define script G. So uh, this is a probability measure on product space S cross U cross S, which I kind of decompose like this. Then once I decompose like this, so this is the marginal distribution of the first on the first component. This, so think of this as a distribution of X and say this is a conditional distribution of the control given X because I'm randomizing controls and this would be the conditional distribution of the next state given the current control, current state and current control. 
once any any major like uh, on triple this triple can be decomposed in this way but i can always interpret this as a control because that's what randomized controls are the pro given a state uh, i cook up a probability major on the control space so the extra condition i am putting is that this should be invariant so thinking of this as a control the transition kernel would be this okay so i'm using this control so this is the probability of going from x to y then eta 0 should be an invariant major under this stationary distribution under this okay this i have, have used before i defined it but anyway you already know what it is then this it you get the counterpart of what i had written the discrete version but except that this is now a controlled version okay so it generalizes in the sense that the control version of a dunsker version formula now as i said the hypothesis can be relaxed one thing one can relax this was this was something i wouldn't have bothered about it was driven by venkatanantram i'll tell you the reason later you can allow minus infinity as a value and this need not have a full support and the extension is basically you approximate if it doesn't have a full support you approximate by a sequence, a sequence p epsilon dy given xu where uh, where for each positive epsilon it has full support and let epsilon go to zero and push it what is that also full what is that is it dual in this setting right yeah full like neither will be represented as the log zero and times no no that that's in fact an in between step and the proof of this goes through that we use the gibbs variation principle to so have some log expected value of some exponent you write that as a, yeah, that's one of the things the, i mean the derivation that's probably the first step but the other see the catch here is that uh, it does play a role but it's not for example i, I cannot write uh, cannot do, go the other way here if that's what you mean yeah, uh, no no that i cannot do that potential agent transform generalization no no but that's because this supremum is not all, or all positive all probability measures if that was there i could have done it here there's a non trivial constraint that the first marginal is an invariant major under the transition probability defined by the rest but uh, i mean um, it's a long derivation which does use the gibbs variation principle somewhere in the middle so the interesting thing is that we have got a concave maximization problem which is as good as it gets so this this i have to again tell you what uh, why this so there's a most commonly studied problems are uh, minimizing risk sensitive cost and the standard approach is to use something called a lock transform so you are, if you are so what you get okay maybe we should backtrack a bit so what you get is the a multiplicative dynamic probability equation so for that long run average problem which i mentioned here the let me just write down the dynamic probability equation which will be something like this so let me just uh, assume they depend only on x for simplicity x u we will let it depend on u and min over u of all this so this is uh, this is classical as i said for the discrete finite state case it goes back to howard but what you get here is the multiplicative counterpart of it Okay, so just uh, replace plus by into and minus by uh, uh, divide you get this so it is a nonlinear eigen value problem this was my operator so this is my operator operating on v so i have tv equal to lambda v so it's actually a nonlinear eigen value problem and uh, the corresponding kind of uh, uh, both in continuous and discrete time one approach has been to write v as e to the phi say and write equation for phi so that's called a lock transform that's been used extensively in um, also in large deviations it was particularly used uh, i mean used a lot and popularized by wendell fleming and his collaborators it is uh, there's a long history for this in 
applied mathematics is good. Something similar was used long back, uh, it's called Kohlhoff transformation, which converts Burger's equation to heat equation. So you basically go, go from a Hamilton Jacobi type nonlinear equation to either an elliptic or parabolic uh, and vice versa. Okay, so that's what that's the classical approach. And what uh, Fleming et al. did the first uh, first paper in one of the continuous time case was by Fleming and McEnany. And what they do is to convert the kind of uh, the by the dynamic programming equation into an equation for this kind of thing, but it's no longer an, a control problem. It becomes a game game problem. You introduce an artificial uh, to, uh, cost or reward. If this is a minimization, you will in, introduce an artificial reward, and it becomes a zero sum game. It converts a dynamic programming equation for a control problem into a what's called an Isaac's equation for a game problem, which is also true in discrete time. So that's the traditional approach, and you get, as I said, you get a zero sum game. If you just mimic that here. The difference is that you are introducing some kind of a dummy character. I mean, it's not apparent in the way I have written. This is some imaginary another player. There are this you playing the uh, game and another person. And what it would tell you that the two maximizations would have to be unrelated in the sense that they're, they're non-cooperative. They have to be done separately without the two sitting together. So what will happen here is that the, the, this control and uh, so you are also maximizing over the choice of the, you are mag, uh, maximizing over eta, okay? So that's another kind of separate maximization, maximization of probability major and maximization over the u. They in some sense have to be done non-cooperatively. Maybe I'll, yeah, so what, what it will translate into is that this u will have to go. So it will have to be a product, uh, given x, it will have to be a condition, u and y will have to be conditionally independent. That becomes a hard problem. Okay, it's a team problem, it's a what's called a team problem. So uh, in the sense there are two players, it's no longer zero sum, they're trying to maximize the same thing, but they are not allowed to discuss, they take independent decisions. So whereas we have a nice con con concave maximization problem, which is a, just a maximization problem, nothing, nothing else. So that's, a, that's why I kind of highlighted this. And okay, so you can, uh, you, uh, not unexpected, let's say, it's enough to consider randomized Markov controls. You don't have to sort of look at control which can use the sort of old entire history and so on. There are some things related to entropy penalized controls. So this I don't remember what exactly it does, but this Todorov look, identify a certain class where you just by manipulation, it's a little restrictive, more restrictive than this. By manipulating the multiplicative equation, you can make it a linear system. And then you can consider the control problem under this, and this guy is con same framework, they looked at the regret problem. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is a problem, uh, see Venkat uh, pulled out uh, an exercise from Cover and Thomas book on information theory, which looks for growth rate for number of directed paths in a graph. And that's where you need minus infinity as a reward. Now he has some idea about uh, it's useful in coding theory. I have no clue, so I won't talk about it. <laughs> and then purpose of optimization problems also. If you actually the one of the early works in this maximization of exponential rewards was by Tom Cover again, and it appears as a chapter in his book. But uh, there's some reason again the the community prefers putting a minus sign in front of R and looking at the minimization problem, which is not equivalent. See, see all, all these old problems like this, uh, discounted or average, if, if I have to ma maximize this, it's same as minimizing equivalent uh, problem with minus R here, same here. It's not true if it's exponentiated. But they change it to, uh, there's some finance reason which I don't know why that, uh, that's uh, bitter. So that's what they do. And, uh, huh? Discounted cost. No, no. Exponential, the risk sensitive, but they put a minus sign in front of R and consider the minimization problem. Uh, uh, no, somebody explained it to me, but it was kind of went over my head. But so the discount rate would be. No, no. No, it's not a discount. The reward itself is exponentiated. There's no discount. 
you are trying to optimize the growth rate of the exponent. So it will blow up exponentially. You are just trying to maximize so the finance. People are always optimistic. They want to the infinite life and want to maximize the growth. Probably. <laughs> So you can also uh, map the problem of minimizing the exit rate from a domain to, uh, you can map it to this kind of problem, you'll see that soon enough. Okay, so this is, yeah, you'll see, see it right now. So uh, again, I'll give some background. There's something called chance constraint control problems which are hard. So for, uh, suppose uh, this simple problem, finite horizon for a given t, and you want to ensure that it doesn't exit this set with a guarantee that doesn't exit this set with some given probability close to one. So we want to keep the probability of getting out of some good set very low. So this has been done kind of by brute force by these people, by augmenting state space basically. So, and this is also related to something which is extremely hot in control. I mean, they use it a lot. with something called model predictive control. So th these are in principle infinite horizon problems. What do you mean? They mean in general, very large horizon. And what they do is that uh, infinite horizon problems, I mean, these dynamic program equations can be hard to solve sometimes. So they just solve a finite horizon problem for a large horizon. So that will tell you, suppose at time n, I solve a pro problem from n to n plus t. So I am at time n and uh, just for the in time interval of length t, I solve the control problem. It will give me control at uh, each time v and m. Uh, at time m, it will give me some control Vn of the current, uh, what did I do here? Yeah, this is a function, so uh, uh, there's one more argument actually. So you get a policy, so the problem itself depends on n because the interval depends on n, and maybe I should have written this way. And at time n plus m, I should have, I shall use some control which is a function of the current state, xn plus m. So this function will also depend on n and m. But you don't use those controls from n to n plus t. What you do is, at just the first one you use, at time n you use this, and when you move to n plus one, you solve the problem again from n plus one to n plus capital T plus one. And the reason is that uh, this, uh, because actually the uh, it's a infinite horizon problem. Once you get close to the last time, things can be misleading. So this is used, for example, in, uh, I mean, this is my uh, collaborator here he uses this for fisheries management in Queensland. So suppose you are planning for a year and uh, you come up with this policy and uh, try to use it. It will tell you that uh, at the end of the year, there's no tomorrow. I mean, so just eat up all the fish. And then uh, the, for the next year, there's nothing. So that's a kind of, uh, obviously for fish lovers like me in particular, it's a disaster. So uh, you have to, so what they do is just at time zero, you uh, you use just the uh, immediate control. At next time, you resolve the problem. From that point of time to, so 1st January, I solve the problem and use the control of 1st January. 2nd January, I solve the problem again from 2nd January. 2019 to 2nd January, 1st January of 2020, and use the first control again, keep moving that window. This has been successfully used. I mean, it's a successful kind of heuristic, even in kind of cell-driven autonomous vehicles, etc. So, to, but it's painful to calculate, as you might guess. So, what uh, we tried was to consider limiting case at t tends to infinity. So, it's an in, infinite horizon, but to ch change it a bit. So, add some absorbing state, artificial absorbing state and define this so this is a transition kernel control by uh, phi to restrict it to s naught and normalize okay and let's define c phi as log of this now you want to maximize this reward as t as t tends to infinity but subject to the exit rate being constrained okay you don't want to exit out of that set uh, very fast so the tau is the first time you get absorbed into delta. Now this, this thing decays exponentially, so you can see the risk sensitive thing coming. So lambda is the exponential decay rate of exit probability, and which happens to be the principal eigenvalue of the substochastic kernel which I had defined, and because of which 
Okay, maybe I'll skip some of these things. So yeah, you can just make this look like a recessive control problem. And then I have the pro uh, I, have, I can reduce it to an optimization problem, but here the risk sensitivity was not the cost, it was in the constraint. So there's a normal constraint which, uh, which is common in the average cost problem. So up to this point, it's the standard linear prolonging formulation of average cost. Average cost problems can be made into LP. So this is it. But there's this extra artificial, so another major valued variable which you have to manage, and that has this thing coming out of the representation result I had. Now, this does become a hard problem because it's a team problem. I mean, that this is, it's not a vanilla risk sensitive problem. The risk sensitive reward was in the constraint. So, now you can you can do alternating minimization, and uh, uh, that both are there are two LPs you can alternate between, but no guarantee. It will lead to a Nash point, but not not. Uh, uh, there's no reason to believe it will be the best. In general, other than special cases which uh, Devrat mentioned, in general, alternating minimization. What I mean is that if you, have, you want to minimize f x comma y, for fix y you minimize over x, then minimize over y. Keep going back and forth. It doesn't have to converge to a global minimum if it's a non-convex problem. So uh, this, in this case, for example, we don't know, but there are these uh, matrix problems where it does work. Okay, so this is the reference. How much time is it? It will be 13 minutes. 13 minutes, a lot of time. Okay, <laughs> okay so this, uh, this is, in case I had to stop here, I, I had put this slide, I'll skip it. So part, part three. So this is the, Okay, I'll just talk about the continuous time version. That gets very technical. So I'll just uh, outline it. It should serve as an advertisement for another talk uh, later in this workshop. So, and so this is a, what's called reflected diffusion. So this is a kind of direction of reflu. So this is the stochastic differential equation. This, this is a kind of process which lives on the boundary in the sense that it, it's a non-negative process which increases only on the boundary, only when the process is on the boundary. It's called a local time on the boundary. So this is the indicator. So only when this is one, so this, this is one if xt is in the boundary and zero otherwise. So it increases only when uh, xt is on the boundary. So it kind of pushes the, you add this so that to push the thing back in on the boundary of the set. So this, has, this is confined to some nice uh, bounded set and these are just technical ideas, forget this. Yeah, so this is a kind of direction of reflection and this is a Brownian motion. and. Control is non-anticipative in the sense that it's independent of the feature increments of Brownian motion. Otherwise, you cannot do stochastic calculus. And I'm looking at a minimization problem here. So Nisio semigroup, again, Nisio herself had cleaned it up long back. So this is the operator and it satisfies. It's just, I'm calling it semigroup because it satisfies semigroup property. You know, ST, T times SS will, ST compared with SS is S of T plus S and so on. So all the semi-group theory can be applied. And it has kind of, it's a non-linear, so the infinitesimal generator ends up being this kind of an operator you see in dynamic programming. The usual conditions, and what that tells you is the, with the help of, kind help of non-linear crime Rutman. You know, so basically, you have to go through the semi-group and then go to the infinitesimal version. And and so you apply the non-linear crime Rutman to ST. And you, the positive eigenvalue you get, you write it as e to the root e. And then basically like go, to, go to t equal to zero and extract this formula out of it, which is the collet Wieland form formula. And this is actually dual to this formula, which does uh, curve the net, and dual in the convex analytics sense. So there, this formula, and turns out there's this a con dual version of it. And the variation formula, Again, it's actually, I mean, modulo the technicalities you need to learn, it's actually sleeker than, so, because the, the, uh, the reward, so this is your reward, and this is what, uh, okay, cost for your, or rather, if this is cost, this is reward, and vice versa. So if this is your reward, say, this would be the cost for the imaginary antagonist, the problem creates for you because of a lock transformation. And it's a nice quadratic thing. This happens in continuous time. In discrete time, you have to worry with the uh, Kolbeck library, etc. And you end up uh, writing a formula. So this is the analog of script G there. It's exact counterpart, but the, uh, the formula is simpler. 
is just the original reward minus quadratic uh, cost. And if uh, you know, you know Gesson formula, etc., probably you, it won't surprise you. So extension to RD was incredibly painful. So this is thing on four author paper on archive. So this actually was started by the last two authors. We could push through the finite volume case and struggled with the the hard part. And then this kind of macho mathematicians took over and cleaned it up. So this great man will talk next week. I don't know whether it's related to this or not. This is my former student. I'm extremely proud of him. And this is a colleague from Berkeley days uh, with whom I continue to collaborate with in UT Austin. This is, okay, anyway, this part is easy. So this is something I also use this for some other purpose, which is to come up with some. So in, for average cost, you know, it's, uh, generally when, at least in basic courses, you learn the irreducible case. There's a nice clean dynamic programming equation, which I wrote there. So what happens is that if it is not irreducible, so this beta ends up, so this is a equation V and beta. And what happens is that if it's not, uh, so beta is, it turns out to be the optimal optimal reward, or here it's optimal cost, which doesn't depend on where you start because it's irreducible. But if it is reducible, you will get uh, beta dependent on x. And then you get another equation, beta x should be minimum over, let me write some bx of, okay, this is for the, known only for the finite case, so I won't try to be over smart. I, you. Where this is the minimizer from here. Okay. You get another dynamic programming kind of equation. This was, I think that uh, this probably, this is also, I think, goes back, back to Howard and Kallenberg. So there's a coupled system of equations, and I wanted to get counterpart for risk sensitive. So now I'm in a finite state space case. Same, same framework, but everything is finite and you want to maximize the asymptotic growth rate. And, uh, okay, you, I'll skip this. You just kind of, uh, this uh, in a contrived way, I get another messy looking problem. So what I'm doing at each time, I'm choosing U and uh, the full transition kernel. Okay, at each time I choose a, a, a control variable, a, a variable U, and also choose a full kernel out of arbitrary I mean, the full set of probability measures on the finite state space, and write this as the reward, and want to maximize this long run average reward. And yeah, actually, yeah, maybe I should mention that that concave maximization problem was actually an average reward problem. Okay. You can think of it that way also. But one can simplify it a bit. That's why I sort of rushed through it. You can simplify it a bit. So suppose I define this family of measures. Uh, given I, I choose the kind of probability distribution on the control and the set of probability measures on the state space, and given this, all these three put a probability on the third, on the next state. Then I can map the ma problem into, yeah, so I, I, I require that gamma one should be invariant under the transition kernel corresponding to this. So this is similar to what I did earlier. Then I can make it into a linear program like this. Okay. And again, I am skipping the details because they are just uh, they are not profound. They are just um, messy notationally. So you can keep simplifying it, and uh, eventually you get uh, the, get an LP that write the dual LP, and that ends up being some something nice. So this is the counterpart of basically I have basically converted into an average cost problem and done the Allenberg kind of LP. But then the main thing is I go from go back from this to the dynamic programming equation. So you get end up getting this, and uh, then here I can use the Gibbs variational principle to perform one maximization, which is the first uh, second one, this one. 
and that tells me that the maximum is at, attained here. So you substitute it back and you get something looking like the coupled dynamic programming equations with the interesting twist that uh, you get a twisted kernel here, not the original kernel. Yeah. So this was another thing and uh, future problems. Okay, the extension to non coupled actually as I mentioned, the RD case is the, the, the continuous time case for whole space thanks to Ari Arapostatis and Anub Bishwas has been cleaned up to a fair extent. Discrete is not yet done. There's a discrete and uh, countable state space was done by this uh, person in Mexico, Rolando Cavazos Cadena, under some very strong condition. There's something called Dublin's condition, which is a little too strong, but uh, to be useful. But uh, that's what he has, that's what the state of the art now. And the degenerate case for diffusion is also hard. Degenerate means, okay, uh, uh, I won't get into that. And that's it. Good.